On this week's Midlife Ramble, I'm going to be reviewing the recent certification I did with MedFit, which was for the Menopause Health and Fitness Specialist Certification. I'm also going to talk about menopause nutrition at a very high level. What do you need to know? What should you eat? What does it look like in menopause? So go and grab a cup of something warm and cozy and join me in a minute. Welcome back to Midlife Ramble. If you're new here, welcome. It's great to see you. This is a slowly growing little platform I've got here and I really, really welcome you along. Thank you to anyone who's come back for more. You must be mad, but I appreciate you too. So this is just a weekly chat where I delve into things that might be interesting to you as a midlife woman, maybe going through menopause. I talk about health, fitness, whatever else is out there in the wellness space. And then I touch on other stuff that might be interesting for you. And so, yeah, let's get started. So I was supposed to do this last week, but as I explained to you, I had a week off because I had some traveling to do. I went to Ottawa to work with my team at Naya. We're building um, a full suite solution of healthcare for Canada. It's super exciting. It's a ton of work. We ended up building our business model completely. We're gonna get that reviewed. We're gonna look for angel investors. It's very exciting. And so anytime I'm sort of not on social media, my head's down and I'm pounding away to try and get this done. Um, for those of you that are into sort of fitness and nutrition and just wanna learn more about menopause, my sort of contribution to this is gonna be with the membership site and we're gonna have essentially Peloton for menopause, it won't be called that, but we're calling it digital therapeutics. So anything that goes alongside the medical needs that you, you need through midlife and through menopause. And so I've built this team of amazing coaches and um, we can't wait to start delivering this. We're hoping for April for that. So, you know, stay by for a little bit more information and I hope I can just keep filling you in as the time goes by. So that was in Ottawa um, and this is the team here. We did a little jumpy shot and um, they're such a great team. We have two medical people involved and two business consultants and then little old me. So the five of us together bring a really great um, realm of like expertise and knowledge and just it, it's just a very well-rounded team and we've all got the same mutual goal. So anyway, so that's the team there. And then after that, I was supposed to go to St. John's to deliver two workplace talks for three companies. I joined um, two of them together and there was a big snow dump. So I couldn't go, it got canceled, which wasn't such a bad thing all in all because it was a very quick turnaround for me. Um, and so essentially I ended up doing one of them online and that was really well attended. There was like 120 people there, but a few of them were watching in groups on a big screen. So we think we had about 200 people potentially. And I did a radio show. I'm actually gonna to link to the radio show down here in case you wanna to listen to it. It's so fun to listen to because the um, host of the show, Linda Swain, is a proper Newfoundlander and she has the best accent. And if you've never heard a Newfoundland accent, it's gonna blow your mind. It's like a little bit between Scottish and Canadian and oh, it's so lovely. They're such warm and cozy people. And so I was a bit disappointed I couldn't go, but that's been a reorganized, I think for March, April. I'm just finalizing the dates then. I was supposed to be on TV too on their primetime show, but that's fine. It, it can wait. Menopause isn't going anywhere, is it? And so, yeah. And then in addition to that, I was part of a daily, uh, the Toronto Star, article all about menopause in the workplace. And I was interviewed for that um, based on the statistics that one in 10 women will leave the workplace because they don't feel supported. And, you know, when the Menopause Foundation of Canada did a survey, they found that 47% of women didn't have a clue about what menopause was. And 87% felt like they couldn't even talk to their employers about it. So, you know, that's something that's simple to change easy to impl implement and they've probably got most of the requirements in place already. They just need to know what menopause is. And so I was in this article and the funny thing about it was, is I was trying to be cute and funny and I said something really profound, you know, just like you would imagine. <laughs> and then they, they bloody quoted me this, I'll put it up here, but essentially I'm like along the lines of, yeah, women can be sensitive to noise 
through perimenopause and menopause and so when Bob's eating his dinner too loudly it's a little bit frustrating it'd be good if we had quiet spaces and they quoted me on that and I'm like <laughs> of all the things that you've assigned to me it's you know hitting on poor Bobby who's a noisy eater but whatever it's just raising the profile of this conversation isn't it today I'm drinking <clears throat> chamomile tea and I'm probably going to be clearing my throat a lot. I'm still a big bag of mucus. I'm sorry, TMI, but this, since I had COVID last November, this cough hasn't gone. I went and had an endoscopy. They did a full scope. They found I have like chronic GERD, which I already knew, which is the gastroesophageal reflux um, disease, um, which is essentially just acid reflux, but like just pimped out. It's just like more chronic. It's always there. And so I'm on some PPI medication that's the strongest they can give me and also they said you basically have to aid this with your diet now I pretty much eat really well but the things that I eat are the things that are pissing off my good and it's everything I love chocolate alcohol well I don't really eat too much of those I don't have a super sweet tooth but I don't mind chocolate and I don't drink so that's not too bad but any caffeine and I just felt like crying so coffee tea green tea, black tea, ugh, whatever, all of it. But I drink decaf, so I found some decaf English breakfast tea and I'm drinking chamomile tea, which makes me gag, but I love hot drinks, especially on a day like today where it's snowing. Um, and then onions, garlic, tomatoes, spicy foods, or you name it, it's all the foods I like. Um, so means that my food is a bit bland at the moment and I really need to do this for at least a month but I'm just glad there's nothing serious there and it's something that can be managed um but there apparently is a tie in between having COVID and exacerbating the GERD symptoms and seriously because this is not my first rodeo because this happened to me with long COVID back in 2020 I'm not super surprised. So in Toronto, we've had a pretty mild winter so far, but you can see I've got the fire on. It's snowing outside. It was snowing last week when it was um, a PD day for the kids. So I took my son snowboarding and we went out. Well, he went out um, with the GoPro. I actually filmed this on my GoPro. I love the GoPro. And um, he took it out and look at the video he took with it. Like, it's so cool. Um, and I stopped skiing about five years ago and I think it was due to perimenopause like anxiety like I just lost belief in myself and we talk about this a lot and I got super nervous on the slopes and I ended up taking my skis off and going down on my bum and you know shouting at my husband saying fuck you <laughs> poor guy and um I haven't been on since and it was that day when I was there I was looking at my son on the snowboard and it was really quiet and it was really sunny I mean you can see from the video how blue the sky is and I just thought, maybe I might try again. So may it actually is the very first time in about five years I felt like I maybe want to try again. So I'm really glad that feeling's back. I mean, I tried the cross-country skiing and loved it. I've only actually tried it once. I haven't actually been able to get out there again just because of traveling. I try I'm going to try and do that before the season's over, of which I think there's only four weeks left because that's me being optimistic. And I still haven't been ice skating yet, so all of these big laid plans never turned out. But I'm feeling good about feeling enthusiastic about trying new things again. And that's sort of something I want to put out there to you all. I mean, have you felt that happen to you, that loss of confidence in doing new things and trying new activities and learning new physical things? Because it's like actually the physical component component that I'm talking about, where we don't believe in our athletic ability as much as we did. And I'm, I'm very keen to encourage women to sort of try that. So I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Okay, as we move on, I've got tons of admin -y stuff to talk about. So I'm just going to go through my list. I have my notebook right next to me. And so um, today we're going to talk about the new certification that I just completed um, that might be of interest to you if you're in the fitness industry. You have to actually be um, a fitness coach professional to do this. It's part of our sort of like standardized learning protocols and there's continuing education um, credits involved in this too if you're interested. I'm going to talk about some high level nutrition for menopause and I don't want to dig into the weeds yet. I want to just give you bits and bobs um, over the weeks so, so not to overwhelm you but just reassure you and give you a sort of like a little bit of knowledge. So a couple of things looking at my list. So 
The Matriarch series is listed here on YouTube. There will be a new one going up later today. It's Wednesday today and there will be a new one going up later today. I'm called Winnie and the Matriarch series is a series of workouts that I'm going to assign these wonderful names of days gone by of women who've inspired us and I've been given I think I might have about 40 names now, so it's really inspiring for me to do so. Um, yep, yeah, so look out for that. But if you're ever wondering where these workouts are, I have a playlist here on YouTube, and so you can just go to those. And I think you're enjoying them. People seem to be, so that's really cool. My documentary that I'm going to be part of was supposed to be filmed in St. John's. Um, obviously, that had to, to be postponed. I'm looking to do another on site location, workplace talk that they can video and do that later but she's coming to Toronto on March the 4th and I'm gonna actually film her filming me and show you her filming me it'd be like meta 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 <laughs> um and I'm excited about that she doesn't want to be on camera she wants to be behind the camera but she's an amazing um documentary filmmaker so I'm sort of excited about that and about bringing menopause into you know, the Canadian sphere and the North American sphere because it, the, it's covering the full sort of like geographic area. So that's going to be exciting. Let's have a look what else I wanted to talk to you about. Oh yeah, my podcast, I've recorded two sessions of the 12 that will be coming up. Um, I think I'm releasing them in April. I've decided to do like April and October releases because it takes the pressure off me. It's really quite difficult to stay on top of everything. And so... I record them all in March, get them published in April, and they come out April to June, They'll one a week. And so the first person is Dr. Pauline Mackey, um, who is a neuroscientist, and who her specific work is looking at um, menopause and brain fog, and brain fog being that sort of umbrella term that makes us look at cognitive impairments, you know, losing our words and um, feeling discombobulated, all of the things that go um, with sort of menopause and not quite feeling ourselves. And it was a really reassuring and informative talk. And basically it was, um, the good thing that I got from it is that one menopause does not cause dementia. And she was like saying, look at how long women live into their eighties. We know that there's all these women living without dementia so we can't say that menopause causes dementia and the second thing was if you're not a woman who takes hormone therapy and you're concerned about um, dementia of any kind we know that the brain regrow regrows and creates these new neural pathways and so essentially hormone therapy creates a pathway at one side of the brain and if you're not on that then the, the left side of the brain will create identical sort of neurotransmitters and it was a little bit um outside of my knowledge base but it was a real learning experience and a real comforting experience and essentially I just feel like everyone should listen to it of course you should all listen to it and then the second one was with a friend who I met um only online um but I followed her for years her name is Jo Mosley and she um somebody else that had a bad perimenopause experience and she was a single mom and she decided that she needed to find herself again move again she was really quite depressed and needed to find just find herself so her story is very cool she decided to learn to stand up paddleboard and then she did this like coast to coast paddleboard um journey and she had a documentary filmmaker do it with her and she wrote a book about it and she um, along the way she made it like an odd touristic experience by becoming like a, a like a womble anyone in the UK will know that but like collecting trash and rubbish from the waterways so she's on a paddle board and she's picking up all of the trash from the water and she's just an all-around good person but she's somebody in her mid to late 50s who's found a new passion and took a chance and it's a super inspiring story. Anyway, so I've got two down, 10 to go. I've got some great guests lined up. If you want to check out all of the previous episodes, that's in the show notes too. And we're down to 50,000 downloads. So that's awesome. I um, It's something I do for free. It's something that I've never tried to um, monetize as in get a sponsor. But I think I'm getting to the point where I might start looking for a sponsor. So if anybody knows somebody that you think that I should work with then uh, let me know that would be like really cool this weekend my friend Kim Schlag is coming into town now Kim if you don't know is a 
health and fitness um, expert. So it's similar to me, she does focus on weight loss, fat loss in menopause, um, something that I don't do, and she's got a new program coming out actually in March, which I'll probably tell you all about nearer the time. But she's coming in town because we've never actually met in person and so we're having like a Toronto Canadian weekend and so I'm going to be going with my GoPro everywhere we go so you can see her and we've got like a really fun weekend planned. We're going to go out for dinner just on Friday night with my friend Abby Langer because we're all in Toronto together. So we're going for a French rest to a French restaurant where I'm probably going to struggle with the food because I really want duck comfy but duck comfy doesn't like me at the moment. And then... Um, on the Saturday morning, we're doing a meetup in High Park, which is the local park in Toronto. And we've got 30 women turning up. So I'm going to grab some coffee and some Portuguese tarts. And we're going to have a little drink and a nibble and then go for a ramble around the park. And I'm really excited about it. I'm going to get name badges because there's absolutely no way on God's earth I will remember everyone's name. And then I'm taking Kim out for afternoon tea. And then she wants to eat poutine, which is, you know, an essential in Canada. And I think then on the, the Sunday, we're just going to go for some walks around the waterfront and around some of the neighborhoods. So I'm really looking forward to that. And so I'll do some video and share that with you next week. And I'm actually going to get Kim to sit down and do a little video chat with you as well. So um, you, I can introduce you to her because she's just a really good, good person to follow. I think, you know, there's a lot of scammy people out there and she's just not. She's just a good egg. Okay, so the two main things I want to talk to you about in the show this week are the certification. So the certification is held by a company called Medfit. I'm going to put all the information there in case you're a coach that wants to do this. The Menopause Health and Fitness Specialist. I say it's for health professionals, particularly um, personal trainers, that type of... Um, and, and potentially some doctors could do it too. It sort of bridges the gap between... The medical side and like the biology and the how to apply that to your coaches and this course is to help you to support menopausal women it doesn't give you the right to like analyze their hormones give medical advice and people do that all the time on social media and it drives me nuts just gives you a little bit more of a detailed understanding and so for me it was perfect because I feel like I have enough understanding but this one goes down to cellular level like it breaks it down to the mitochondria like we why our bodies change from a physiological standpoint and because Dr. Carla Di Girolamo is an endocrinologist you know that's the, the viewpoint of this course and so I found it fascinating and the hard thing for me, for me about the course was that I'm in it so I do two interviews right and um but I, I don't get paid for this or like I don't get um, like kickback for anyone signing up. But I just really wanted this to be um, a recognized certification in the industry because there isn't one that I think is any good. I think Dr. Stacey Sims has one. Um, so I apologize about that. But this is one that's probably a bit more cost effective for anyone um, who's wanted to do it. I think it's about 400 US dollars, something like something like that. With continuing education credits. So apart from it being hard to watch myself on camera, which is something I never want to do, I learned a ton. And so there's a test at the end and I got 94%. And I was really pissed off that I got six wrong. And when I went back and read the ones I got wrong, I was like, ugh, these were like schoolgirl errors. I just wasn't concentrating. So damn it. I wish I got 100%. Anyway, um, I thoroughly recommend it if you want to work with this population of women. I think, especially if you're a woman in menopause who's a coach and you want to coach women who are menopausal or midlife or beyond, it just gives you a, just a bit more of a solid foundation and you can just point them to the right resources. None of us are trying to fix or change women, but the more we know, the more we know, right? That's where we've always come from. So talking about what we know and what we don't know, I just wanted to continue the conversation I had about um, nutrition in menopause. And, you know, I did a talk, a workplace talk yesterday, and I'm doing loads at the moment. I think I have 10 for next month, which is making me so happy because you know like it's a very fulfilling thing to do and um I they always ask me to talk about exercise and nutrition and so if I was to tell you like the basic things that you need to be doing that are different in menopause it sort of it might surprise you but it also might not because there's not that much that's different here's what we know we do know that protein requirements increase they increase through aging anyway, but they increase significantly through 
menopause, right? So would, we need to look for where our protein's coming from. So 1.0 to 2.2 grams per um, kilogram body weight, that's a good range. Now, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean in real money? So for example, say I am 60 kilograms. I actually don't know how much I am in kilograms. And I'm an active woman. I should be looking at the higher range of between one and 2.2. So that's essentially gonna be 120 grams of protein. I try and get about 100 grams um, and I, I try really hard to do it because I struggle to eat it. I've explained that before. Um, if you're somebody who doesn't exercise as much and is a little bit more sedentary, then you maybe need to back that up a little bit. Either way, whenever I see any of these sort of ranges, it always comes out to around um, between 80 and 120 grams of protein. So bang on the middle is 100. And so if you look for 100 grams of protein throughout the day, that's a good um, ballpark figure. And it doesn't matter if you don't quite meet it. But if you're training, strength training, it's a it's an essential part of the of the puzzle because we need it for muscle protein synthesis. So if we think about it, we know that um, strength training is the vehicle, right, that, that helps with us to maintain and build muscle. So we've got our strength training, but what's the, what's the fuel? What's the building blocks of it? Well, it's the protein and it's the breakdown of those proteins into amino acids that help to rebuild and rebound type thing from our strength training. So looking for your protein in every meal, load up on those like low calorie, high nutrient foods, and that's gonna be your vegetables and your fruits, predominantly vegetables. So look for those because they're full of fiber. We need about 25 grams of fiber a day, um, and you can easily get that from your food if you eat a variety of food. Also good for gut health, and I hate the fact that gut health is like a big thing at the moment, but you need fiber for a prebiotic. So. You've got your protein 100 grams, you've got 25 grams of fiber from all your fruit and vegetables. And then if you're somebody who's very active and you exercise, then you definitely need to be eating those complex carbohydrates. So then have say a quarter of your plate with your beans, your legumes and your rice and your potatoes, even white potatoes. I don't know why white potatoes have got a bad rap all of a sudden. And especially if you don't like, like the um, sweet potatoes, which I think are just, Fucking gross, ugh. Like, just give me potatoes. So, like, there's a place for all of that, and especially if you if you work out. And then, um, hydration. Like, stay on top of your hydration using your pee for, like, a guide. Like, if you're thirsty, drink. If your pee's dark, drink. And drink can come from tea, coffee, anything. Providing you are mindful of the calories in it, right? So, and it comes in your fruit and veg too. I missed fats out and I didn't mean to. When it comes to fats, typically you don't need to really look for fat because fat's in most foods, especially if you're eating a lot of meat, is likely to contain um, already existing fats in there. But, you know, looking for um, some omega threes and sixes. If you say, for example, if you're not eating um, enough oily fish during the week, consider taking an omega-3 supplement. Um, try and limit the amount of saturated fat in your diet. That just goes without saying because we are at a higher risk of sort of um, cardiovascular disease as we get older. So we need to support that with a reduced amount of saturated fat. Um, alcohol, we need to definitely reduce the amount of alcohol that we're consuming. And then sort of like just in general, if you just look at your diet and just think, you know, I'm hitting all of the targets here, like I'm eating like a well-balanced meal, um, there should be place for those treats. And you know, the hyper palatable meals, like we call it the junk food or the fast food or the the chips and the crisps and the, the Snickers bars and all of those things, there's definitely a place for those in your diet, but they should be fewer and far between. They shouldn't make up the majority of your diet. And essentially, if you look at a food and you know it's got low nutrient um, quality, like it really doesn't add a lot of value, then be, they should be the things that you should be looking to reduce. And never restrict, because you know life's too short and we need to have those treats, right? And so just looking at that, and then, like, on the flip side of that, like, consider this. Are you somebody that's eaten enough food to support your body? If you're very, very active and you've gone to the knee-jerk um, 
move more, eat less, you're probably going to feel like a dirty dish rag. It's not, it's a horrible feeling. I always think like, look at your kids. When your kids are hungry, they're little sods, aren't they? They're just horrible. They're grumpy. They cry. They feel miserable. Well, it's almost like that in menopause again. It's like our bodies just don't like feeling really, really hungry. It's just not great for us. And usually the, the flip side of not eating enough is that by the time the end of the day comes, we just start stuffing food in our mouth in this mindless way and we lose track of where we really are with our nutrition. And so when it comes to menopause, there isn't a specific diet that you need to follow that doesn't, it doesn't exist. The menopause diet sort of doesn't exist. If you wanted to follow a protocol, then definitely like the DASH or the Mediterranean style eating is something that I would highly recommend. But for general guidelines, look for your protein, eat your veggies and your fruit, add some carbs to that, make sure your fats are covered. They usually are. Limit the amount of saturated fat, stay hydrated, limit the amount of fun foods and alcohol, um, and then you should be sort of good to go. I would say that sort of if we're, if we do over consume sugar, you know, we need to keep our added sugar values to sort of a minimum if we can, um, that our bodies don't process the sugars as efficiently as they used to. And so some women feel that when they eat like a high sugar meal, that they sort of feel really wired afterwards. And what I would say to you then is if this is something you've planned for, like a treat and you don't really like the way it feels, then add some protein to it or add some fat to just calm those big sugar spikes that go along with it. But it shouldn't be complicated. And, and the sort of last element of that is body composition changes happen in menopause we're all changing shape and it's sort of a part of getting older and a part of going through menopause and we need to support that as best as we can. So stay on top of your nutrition and then body composition changes are really um, helped through exercise, cardiovascular changes, um, cardiovascular exercise and strength training can really help change the shape of your body. So head over to the matriarch series and you know who knows maybe i'll give your name a shout out too so anyway i hope that was helpful um i can dig deeper into the different elements of you know the macronutrients if needed but i just really would love women to just let stress less over food enjoy food without having to hyper focus and count calories and and become almost it becomes obsessive to the point where you live and breathe what you're going to eat and it shouldn't be like that it should be a lot more relaxed okay i'm going to finish off with a little bit of an update on my projects oh my god it's not been great i did live a bluebird at um the ski resort i hope someone picked it up they haven't got back in touch with me i don't need people to get in touch with me but I do, um, I do like making them and leaving them. Okay, so my vest, my vest, by the way, is beautiful. And I think it's going to actually block really nice. And for those that don't knit, you literally soak it in a warm, softened, softened water with some detergent um, for about 15 minutes. And then you lay it out after you've squeezed the excess water out and you shape it. And it really makes the, the garment just really sharp. And so this is the stage I'm at. So I've got like it finished and um, it, I tried it on and it looks so good. So I just want to show you a couple of things. The edging on this is called an Italian bind off. And it's a very labor intensive, slow way to bind off or cast off if you're in the UK. And I just want to hold this up to the camera. And I hope that this is clear to you. Can you see how the edges are like all rounded? And it gives this really clean, beautiful finish. And if you look a bit closer, can you see the halo? The halo is this fluff. This is baby alpaca. That's what it does. It's this gorgeous, gorgeous look. And it just looks so luxurious. Anyway, so the, the process of this is you, you finish the bottom and then you um, cast on along the, to along the top. And then I'll do it along the um, armholes as well. Well, I did the top and look how gorgeous the neck looks and you can see that rounded edge. I absolutely love the way it looks, but I can't get it over my bloody head. Oh my God. So what happens is it told you to cast off very tightly. And I actually think that that meant for the armholes because the armholes need to be pulled in. I can't even get my head in. Oh, I'm devastated. 
So I'm having to unpick it, but the problem with unpicking it is it's a very complex way to cast off. And it's, it's took me nearly half an hour just to do this. Oh, so I'm, I'm in a bit of a grump about it and I'm sulking. So I'm putting it aside and I'm gonna do it when I can be bothered. Oh, anyway, with regard to my last project, I decided I was gonna do a shawl and I started doing the shawl and it was driving me crazy because the stitches kept, kept slipping um, and I just felt like it was too fiddly and I wasn't in the mood for fiddly. So what I decided to do is pull it all out and I've, I'm doing another shawl. And this is a shawl um, that's gonna be a big triangle shawl. Now, what I decided to do is use an existing ball of mohair and pair it up with the sock yarn that I had left over, which was the one that was like the Aurora Borealis and I made my husband socks with. And so the, the finished look is actually really quite cool, right? I like more hair, it doesn't make me itchy. And I just like the way that this is coming out. And if you can see, it's a super simple garter stitch with a drop stitch in it. And it's gonna be really big by the time it's finished. So I'll be able to like wrap it round and I can use it as a shawl with tassels on or I can use it just as, a scarf and so it's one of those patterns that doesn't have a complex pattern it's super easy to do I can actually visually look and you know it's it, it's a piece of cake really um anyway so that's the one that like goes around with me it's in my knitting bag when I go places and so anyway so I'm doing that to get over the disappointment of my blue one that I just showed you that oh Having to pull all that out is driving me crazy. Okay, I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, three books. The first book that I've just finished is called The Fire Caught by Andrew Taylor. Now, I am a historical fiction junkie. It's just my favorite genre. I love it. I can't get enough of it. Um, and I picked this one up on the Libby app because I'd finished another book for book club, which I didn't like, and I wanted an easy read. And I think it shows you things based on what you've borrowed before. So this is set in, in 1666, The Great Fire of London, and it centers around um, this um, woman who's an heiress, and she has her fortune taken from her, um, and there's like a detective in there, and there's an unsolved murder. And, and it's really cool and it's all between the um, historical ages of Charles I and II. And if, if you don't know, Charles I was executed by um, Oliver Cromwell. And so it's all about that time and it's really good. And apparently there's a series of them, so I've got all of them lined up. I can't wait to read the next one. So they're sort of my like filler books that I'm reading. Um, but then I got sent this one and it's called Unraveling. I don't know if you could uh, see all of this. And so the author, Peggy Orenstein, Orenstein um, she posted this picture on Instagram. And when I saw this picture, I just was like, I love this. I love this woman already. And I don't even know what this book's about. It says here, Unraveling, what I learned about life while shearing sheep, dyeing wool, and making the world's ugliest sweater and essentially the long and short of it is is that during covid when we were all making sourdough she decided she wanted to do this project and not just like knit a jumper but she wanted to pick a sheep shear the sheep weave the wool dye the wool learn how to knit and create this jumper and the whole our oh, sweater sorry jumper sweater are interchangeable by the way <laughs> that's the english um, american thing and you know what i think the outcome of it was is that she learned so much and it wasn't even about knitting i think it was just this whole epiphany she had and i actually want to read to you what the book's about when new york times best-selling author peggy orenstein takes up a subject she plunges in so it's no surprise that her pandemic distraction, knitting, would produce something other than the usual scarves and hats for loved ones. I feel attacked there, but anyway. With her trademark curiosity, 
Orenstein set out to make a sweater from scratch, shearing a ewe, spinning and dyeing the wool, and along the way learned far more than she ever imagined. Yes, she figured out how to de-fleece a sheep, but she also recognised the radical nature of traditional women's work, came to terms with relationships in her family, and faced up to new truths about herself, all while processing personal grief and keeping the anxiety of the times at bay. And so I just think it's just like a totally unusual topic. And so I'm going to read this, I'm going to review this, and I'm going to review it with her. I'm going to get her on my podcast. So she's actually one of the 10 more people I'm going to interview. So Anyway, if you're interested, go and pick this up. I am always looking to support other authors because they've always been, you know, so good to me. And then the last book that I'm going to read that is covered in tea stains because I actually believe that somebody in my family popped their cup of tea on this. We're all tea drinkers. Is Lessons in Chemistry um, by Bonnie Garmus. And it's on the top seller everywhere. And I think it might be a bit of a chick flick with an underlying strong message about women in science. I don't know, but I can tell you right now, I bought this because I like the design. I like the color and I'm often drawn into like the, <laughs> the, the aspect of like the design and how it's been pulled together. And so it's beautiful to look at. I mean, look at her glasses. Can you see they've got like all of the Bunsen burners and test tubes in it. So um, I'm gonna read this one too. So if you've read this, let me know what you think. Okay, so that's it for now. I've kicked my tea over, my carpet's drenched, whatever. I've enjoyed chatting to you. Um, please, please leave a comment. I love hearing from you. Next week, I'll be back to my regular schedule. I will have some um, exciting things to share from Kim when she's been in town. I just think that would be nice for you to see. Um, I'm also gonna look to do a, a Q&A session. And so when I do that, um, I'll let you know. And so you can give me your questions and I can go through them and answer them, um, you know, on, on the show itself. So thank you. Um, please subscribe, like, and hit the ding dong bell thing and it'll uh, let you know <laughs> that there's a new episode. And yeah, just let me know what else you'd like to see me talk about and ramble about on this weekly show. I hope you have a great rest of the week and enjoy your weekend and I'll see you next week. Bye for now.